I want to begin by telling you a story. A story about two men who are on their way, each from his own home, just as you and I have done so tonight, to the temple for the Kal Nidre service. It seems that they had a serious falling out several months ago, the result of an argument in which each accused the other of betrayal. And neither of them, now filled with resentment, has spoken to the other since their falling out. And so, as it happened, the two of them ran into one another that very night at the synagogue door. And moved by Yom Kippur's call to repent and forgive, each declared to one another, let bygones be bygones. They shook hands and they entered. After the Kol Nidre service, one of them said to the other, I wish for you everything you wish for me. <laughs> so, the other replied, starting again already? <laughs> I love this story because in short order, we learn a great deal about the dynamics of forgiveness. How forgiveness might be successful and how it might misfire. First of all, each of these men seem to have had a genuine desire to forgive the other. Let bygones be bygones. Each agrees and thereby implies that he will forgive the other and start again with a clean slate. But forgiveness, we quickly learn, is not as easy as that. Because one of them, at least, still harbors resentment to and anger toward the other. And this residue of ill will emerges quickly when he interprets the comment of the other, I wish you everything that you wish for me, to indicate that the other still holds onto his resentment. And perhaps he does. Perhaps he does hold on to it. Good intentions? Most likely. But still, just below the surface of these intentions lies the potency of entrenched indignation and the desire to strike back. Why? Perhaps because their resentment can only be assuaged by the apology of the other. And no apology has yet been forthcoming. Perhaps holding on to resentment feels good in itself because it gives us a sense of superiority. You hurt me and I'm not letting it go. You are the problem and I will not forgive you until you heal yourself. And so the future of their relationship looks bleak and ultimately, for one simple reason, each of them, still self-absorbed in their resentment, has retreated back into himself. At this point, I want to pose the following question. When I experience a rift with you and feel that our relationship needs to be healed, should my attention be focused on you or on me? Should I dwell on the wrong you did to me and therefore what you need to do to heal our relationship? Or should I focus on myself, my anger, my, resent my resentment, and what I need to do to heal our relationship? This, I believe, is the central question. And so now I want to call upon the recent work of University of Chicago philosophy professor and law professor Martha Nussbaum. Nussbaum, in her recent and provocative book with the title, Anger and Forgiveness, and with the subtitle, Resentment, Generosity, and Justice, 
Professor Nussbaum explores two modes of forgiveness. The first is what Nussbaum calls transactional forgiveness, and I quote her. The road to forgiveness in this type, transactional forgiveness, begins in terrible anger over a wrong one has suffered at the hands of another. Through a typically two-part procedure involving confrontation, confession, apology, and working through, the wronged person emerges triumphant, unburdened from angry emotion, her claims fully acknowledged by the other. And now, and only now, is this person ready to bestow the grace of her non-anger. In this type of forgiveness, my willingness to let go of my resentment and anger depends upon whether you are willing to repent, to apologize, to go through the motions of remorsefulness. The emphasis here in transactional forgiveness is on you and what you must do. Apologize and promise not to do again what you have done so that as a result, I can forgive you. But Nussbaum opposes this transactional two-part process and argues for another way that forgiveness might work, a way that she calls unconditional forgiveness, or as she puts it, the path of unconditional love and generosity. This way is not transactional. It is not the way in which I insist, the wronged person, that you, the one who did the wrong, act first by apologizing. After all, you harmed me. And then and only then will I respond by forgiving you. On the other hand, unconditional forgiveness involves a free and voluntary waving of angry feelings without exacting a prior contrition. Let us note some of the additional differences between conditional and unconditional forgiveness. Conditional forgiveness features what Nussbaum calls the narcissism of resentment, while unconditional forgiveness graciously relinquishes resentment. Conditional forgiveness must begin with you as I await, perhaps smugly, your first move. Unconditional forgiveness starts with me, even though I'm the one who has been wronged. And because unconditional forgiveness starts with me, I don't have to wonder about the genuineness of your apologies. With unconditional forgiveness, I can still hold you accountable, but without rancor and resentment that I have voluntarily given up. And one final thought, Trans transactional forgiveness is when each person waits for the other to make the first move. This means that each is likely to hold on to the past just as our two men outside the synagogue did. Unconditional forgiveness gives up controlling the process and looks hopefully to the future. When we turn to the Torah for further understanding of the power of unconditional forgiveness, we need to look no further than the story of Joseph and his brothers. You may recall how the story begins with Joseph's thoughtlessness and the brothers' red-hot hatred of their brother in return. The brothers devise a plot so as to be rid of him. They kidnap him, throw him into a pit, sell him to merchants who are on their way to Egypt. Good riddance, but not so fast for they are little aware 
at this moment that over time, Joseph will survive many threats to his life and rise to prominence in Egypt. In fact, he will become second in power only to the Pharaoh himself. When years later, famine comes to the entire region, the brothers find themselves coming to the only place that is prepared for the famine, to Egypt itself, to get food. As it turns out, the brothers have come and have to come before Joseph himself, whom they don't recognize, to request the food that they need. Now, at last, Joseph is fully free to exact revenge on those who had caused him so much harm. But what happens? He forgives them and reconciliation ensues. By what process, by what actions does Joseph forgive them? At the very end of the story, we find out. But before we go there, let us note that the brothers have never been punished for the serious crimes they had committed against Joseph, nor have they had the chance, even if they wish to, to apologize to him, to apologize to him for the anguish they had inflicted. And this causes us to wonder, what will Joseph do now that the opportunity is fully before him? Will he deliver harsh retribution? Will he give vent to his altogether justified anger? Will he insist, that is, on transactional forgiveness by first forcing an apology from them, making them pay before he forgives them? Let us find out what he does by returning to the narrative. And I quote, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did him? So the brothers send the following message to Joseph. Before his death, your father left this instruction to us. So shall you say to your brother Joseph, forgive, I urge you, the offense and the guilt of your brothers who treated you so harshly and Joseph was in tears as they spoke to him. His brothers went to, went to him themselves, flung themselves before him and said, we are prepared to be your slaves. But Joseph said to them, have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? Besides, although you intended to harm, to harm me, God intended it for good, so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. And so fear not, I will sustain you and your children. Thus did Joseph reassure them, speaking kindly to them. Now what is it that we find here in this passage? Three striking gestures, I believe. Each of them, we should note, initiated by the one who was wronged, by Joseph. First, he forgives his brothers, unilaterally and with kindness. He never asks for an apology or any kind of groveling whatsoever. Nor does he exhibit anger or resentment or indignation. Secondly, he turns away from anger into compassionate hope. He doesn't hold on to the past, but turns to the future. I will sustain you and your children as a sign of his overriding concern not for his prerogatives, not for his anger, but for his family's future well-being. And thirdly, 
Joseph tells the brothers a story, a story meant to reduce their guilt, a story that Aviva Zornberg calls a therapeutic narrative, a narrative that heals. And thereby, Joseph takes a giant step toward repairing his relationship with his brothers. Now, perhaps Joseph believes this story, literally, but the truth of that narrative is less important than its intended effect, healing and reconciliation and a family going into its future whole. God intended what you did to me for good so as to bring about the present result the survival of many people. And so we now know what Joseph required of himself and how he acted. But now let's get personal for a moment. What is required of us today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow? The Torah will guide us once again this time with some of its most famous lines. You shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hate and love, two of our strongest emotions. You can see that the Torah is going for something very big here. Note that both imperatives feature a subject who acts, you, you shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart, you and I as subjects. And it features an object who is acted upon, my kinfolk and my neighbor. And where in these imperatives does the main emphasis fall? It's on the subject, isn't it? You and I are called upon to act, not in response to what the other does or might do, but independently and freely to make the first move ourselves. Don't tolerate hatred in my own heart and love my neighbor as myself or as we might say, love my neighbor as I love myself in the same way that I love myself. Now I want to ask you a question. How can I truly love someone else unless I first love myself? How can I generously offer forgiveness to the other unless I am comfortable with who I am and therefore not needing to beat you up in order to elevate myself? How can I give without first needing to receive unless I have already all that I fundamentally need? Both of these commandments demand that I look first to myself. What do I need to do to heal my relationships? My first obligation is to cleanse my own heart of hatred, of resentment, of an anger that is a poison. Weaning myself from an easy resentment must begin not with you, but with me and it will eventuate in generosity toward you. And so on this Yom Kippur, let us resolve that we will not wait for the other to apologize, that we will not cherish our resentments. I love this phrase, I think it's potent. That we will not cherish our resentments or hold on to our anger in gestures of self-righteousness. That our forgiveness will not be conditional, but unconditional, as acts of generosity and love. 
and that we do so with an eye not on the past, holding on to the past, not on the past, but on the future with optimism, with energy, and with hope. Toward those with whom we have fractured relationships, may we lead with, let us let bygones be bygones and really mean it. And when the other approaches us with let bygones be bygones, let us accept that gesture without suspicion and without rancor and resolve to respond with healing gestures of our own. Out of the brokenness of the past, let there come a healing for the future. And may we have the strength to forgive with generosity and with love. Amen.